Whoa, 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 stop, stop. Let's not do this again. Okay, please. That is a great impression of Ezra. So Ezra is a book of the Old Testament of the Bible, and it was presumed to have been written by Ezra himself. The Jews are released from captivity and allowed to go back to their homeland, basically is the story of the book of Ezra. But along the way, there are some uh, almost catastrophic setbacks, and that's kind of where the real drama of this very, very short book um, you know, takes place. It takes place with, yes, everyone's finally coming home. Everyone's, you know, the, the Jewish state, the Jewish, uh, you know, community is being rebuilt after it's been destroyed due to its own poor decisions. And just as things are getting really, 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 you know, looking very promising, it looks like, uh, you know, the Holy Land will be restored, the people, the Israelites, predictably do some things that uh, almost make that not a reality and, uh, Ezra's like, no, 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 stop, please. Fascinating, and I gotta say that uh, I really, really, uh, to use an old term, I really dug the book of Ezra. The beginning is very like, whoa, I'm like reading these ancient kings' letters uh, to the Jews and then the, the, the Jewish letters to these big kings. King Cyrus, he made a decree to, to let the Israelites go, uh, to let the Jews go. And he said, you know, you go rebuild your temple. It's like, I found that was, that's interesting how the God of the Bible told this guy to do it. And then he actually did it. And uh, then all the subs subsequent kings and how all of their interactions with the Jews, how they kind of forgot that decree. And then they rediscovered it. And then they were like, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to make, we're going to do God's will, even though this is not, even though we're, we're not God's chosen people. I found that whole situation deeply interesting in every way. There's a lot to be learned from the book of Ezra. Even though it's such a short book, um, the whole theme of repentance and forgiveness, the the Jews, the Israelites repenting of their of the quite large sin that they uh, that they commit in this book and Ezra's plead basically for mercy and plead uh, you know, you know, just plead, pleading to the people, let's please, let's not make the same mistakes that destroyed us in the first place. Let's start anew. That whole situation was just really, um, is really powerful. Every single time a people is prosperous, they become spoiled and then they just ruin everything. And that's the history of, um, uh, of the Jews and of the Israelites, and that's the history of uh, just all civilizations everywhere. And for that reason, I think the book of Ezra is uh, very timely, considering what America's been going through and how uh, unrepentant we are of the many evils we have committed, both on a you know, national governmental scale, but also on just a personal, you know, American citizenry level. I mean, we just... We have lost the way in many respects, I think. Um, and not just from a religious perspective. I think, I think everybody would kind of agree Americans are, American society is not, um, not what it could be and should be. So the whole idea of repentance and, uh, you know, um, changing from the old ways that, that, uh, that ruin societies, it's something that I think all of Western civilization should, um, should consider. Um, Let's not keep doing the same things that end up ruining everything that is good. Ezra really was a terrific read. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to jump into the analysis and uh, discussion uh, regarding the different passages and verses in the book of Ezra that I found uh, to be compelling and, uh, you know, just interesting and uh, worth talking about. So the first passage I would like to discuss is Ezra chapter 6 verses 1 through 12. Um, I'm not going to read the whole passage. There is a little bit at the end that I do want to read because it's just like, whoa. Um, but uh, what I find so fascinating about this passage is, so the king primarily involved in this passage is King Darius. And he has basically been told, uh, you know, by the Jews, like, hey, King Cyrus, your, you know, your former king, the, you know, the guy who's long before you, said that 
uh, we the Jews were allowed to rebuild our city and rebuild our temple. So stop, uh, you know, stop treading on us. By royal decree, we have this right. Um, and it doesn't matter whether or not uh, we will be a burden on your economy or we're an unruly people. We have, we, it's, it's law that we're allowed to do this. And King Darius was like, hmm, well, uh, let's do a search. And uh, so in this passage, he, uh, he issues an order and they search the archives stored in the treasury of Babylon and they find Cyrus's decree proclaiming all the things the Israelites said that he decreed. And then you get to read, basically what I find so fascinating about this passage is that Darius, it's like he severely obeys. Like it's, like it's not just like, okay, let them do what they want to do. I mean, he's like, no, we're gonna follow this decree to a T. We're going to help the Israelites rebuild their temple, rebuild their civilization. And anyone who uh, per tries to prevent them from doing this will be severely punished. In fact, he even says, furthermore, and this is verse 11, I decree that if anyone changes this edict, a beam is to be pulled from his house and he is to be lifted up and impaled on it. And for this crime, his house is to be made a pile of rubble. May God who has caused his name to dwell there overthrow any king or people who lifts a hand to change this decree or to destroy this temple in Jerusalem. Now the great mystery and like the thing that I find the most compelling about this passage is it's just like the reverence that King Darius and obviously King Cyrus before him had for God and for God's chosen people even though they were not of that chosen people. I mean, it's fascinating to me. I, I wish there was more writing, more information about these guys so that maybe you could get some more insight into why they personally were so committed to serving God in the way that they were serving him uh, in this book in re with regard to the Israelites. Like I, you know, it, it's, it's like, whoa, Darius was not messing around. Like he was like, hey, if you, if anybody messes with, with the Jews, <laughs> they've got another thing common. Moving on to the next uh, passage, or rather chapter, that I would like to actually read and discuss is Ezra chapter 9. It's a short chapter, but I would like to read the whole thing and kind of go through it with you because um, this is basically, I find, I, I find it to be the most powerful and the most um, important part of the book. And it, uh, it's very revealing about the character of Ezra, and it's also very revealing just about the character of mankind. Uh, and it's, there's a lot of wisdom to be found here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and read the passage and then we will dig into it further. After these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, the people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the people around them. Real quick, uh, I'd like to read the My Life Application Bible's explanation because when I read that I was like have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them like why is that a problem why 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 can't races mix seems like that's uh, should be okay right uh, and luckily uh, my Bible with its uh, footnotes has I think a, a, a decent enough explanation for me to be like, okay, I get it, I understand. I'll go ahead and read that and then we'll move on. Since the time of the judges, Israelite men had married pagan women and then adopted their religious practices. Even Israel's great king Solomon was guilty of this sin. Although this practice was forbidden in God's law, it happened in Ezra's day and again only a generation after him. Opposition to mixed marriage was not racial prejudice because Jews and non-Jews of this area were of the same Semitic background. The reasons were strictly spiritual. A person who married a pagan was inclined to adopt that person's pagan beliefs and practices. If the Israelites were insensitive enough to disobey God in something as important as marriage, they wouldn't be strong enough to stand firm against their spouse's idolatry. 
Until the Israelites finally stopped this practice, idolatry remained a constant problem. Now we will reread that verse and move on. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And the leaders and officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled my hair from my head and beard and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered around me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. And I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Then at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement with my tunic and cloak torn and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God and prayed. O oh my God, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift up my face to you, my God, because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our forefathers until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary, and so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not deserted us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, O, God, o our God, what can we say after this? For we have disregarded the commands you, have, you gave through your servants, the prophets, when you said, The land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time, that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt. And yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins have deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we again break your commands and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? O Lord, God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it, not one of us can stand in your presence. So basically in chapter 9, Ezra is like freaking out. He's like, man, we're going to be a great people again. We're going to, you know, we're going to... You know, tread upon the heights. We're gonna be, we're gonna be a great, righteous, holy people. Prosperity will come back. We will no longer be a poor people. Uh, we will know. We will be free from our the bondage that we have uh, brought on ourselves for so many generations. It now looks like we're gonna get over the hump, and then you know the people revert back to the things that uh, got them in their uh, you know uh, trouble in the first place. And Ezra is like, no, stop, please stop. Oh gosh, please stop. He sits down, he tears his clothes, tears his hair, his beard. I mean, he's appalled. He's like, how stupid can people be? And he just prays and he pleads to God. He's just like, we are unholy. We, are, we, we don't deserve you. We don't deserve mercy. We, we, we betray you time and time again. And by his authenticity in his speech, in his prayer, in his plead, uh, by his reverence for God, by his, uh, his, his willingness to speak the truth both from a historical perspective and from uh, a biblical perspective, a, 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 a holy perspective, Ezra illustrates to all the people that listen to him, as you see throughout the rest of the book of Ezra, he illustrates just by this one speech he illustrates just what is wrong with every, with with uh, with the Israelites and with 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 their uh, with their sin, and he, by him doing this, it convicts the people, and they repent and they are forgiven. Just this illustration of bold speaking of the truth. Uh, I don't know. It, it definitely had a large impact on me, uh, and it makes me want to never be a coward that remains silent when 
I ought to speak. Because by me speaking when others are silent, by me telling the truth when others lie, by me standing when others sit down, I could, or not necessarily me, but God could, change those around me in a positive way just by me opening my mouth and proclaiming what is right and true. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, those are my uh, thoughts, opinions, views uh, on the book of Ezra and the various verses and passages in the book of Ezra that I found uh, particularly compelling and worth talking about. Um, but now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to know what you thought of the book of Ezra. So if you've read the book of Ezra, please uh, write any comments or questions you may have in the comment section below. Or if you haven't read the book of Ezra, uh, you know, also leave a comment there too. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe and tell your friends about the channel. And never forget to...